Hello and welcome to Hot Issues. This week, we are looking at many things. We are looking at food sustainability. We are looking at food sovereignty. What does our independence mean and so on? We are looking at ecology. We are looking at science and we are looking at many, many other things. And we are particularly privileged to have somebody who understands all of these things. Indeed, she's described as an eco-scientist. She's an activist. She's been around the world. And she's concerned about issues of food sovereignty. Welcome to Hot Issues. Today, we'll be looking at many issues. We'll be looking at genetically modified foods. We'll be looking at, uh, you know, the ecology. We'll be looking at science. We'll be looking at all kinds of things. And we are particularly lucky, indeed privileged, to have with us Dr. Vandana Shiva. She's an activist, and she's been campaigning against genetically modified foods and others. And we are particularly privileged to have with her, to have her with us in this conversation. You're welcome to the studio. Buddha. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Mr. Pratt. Why are you in Ghana? I'm in Ghana for solidarity with uh, the Food Sovereignty Alliance and movement that is very strong in Ghana, uh, with the African Alliance for Food Sovereignty. And as a world citizen, as a planetary citizen, who is seeing the threat of five companies which have controlled the chemicals of the world for warfare and for agrochemicals, now wanting to control the seed by all kinds of tricks. Uh, I've dedicated the last 30 years of my life to both understand, study, research uh, what this new economic system looks like with the Intellectual Property Rights Agreement of the World Trade Organization, which Monsanto said it had written in 1995. They said, we achieved something unprecedented. We wrote a law, gave it to a government, which imposed it on the world. We were the patient, diagnostician, and physician all in one. We defined a problem, and the problem they defined was that farmers save seed. And they offered a solution. And it was the solution of making seed saving by farmers a crime through patent law by making it intellectual property, through breeders' rights laws by making it a breeders' right property, or by simply making diversity and farmers' breeding illegal. Um, I don't think we've had an imperialism so deep. We've had colonization. We've had empires. But an empire over the entire life forms of this planet built on false scientific claims built on false promises built on twisting facts and reality built on hounding independent scientists who do some research when we talk about food sovereignty what do we exactly mean by food sovereignty well sovereignty of course means self-determination it means self-governance it means self-rule this is what we all achieved when we fought against colonialism and we became sovereign we became independent food sovereignty means being sovereign in your food being free as far as your food is concerned from the seed that is the first link in the food chain. Food sovereignty is based on seed sovereignty, that farmers have their own seed supply. After all, they have been the breeders over centuries. That seed be a commons, shared as a commonwealth, not the private property of five companies. That the methods of farming evolve according to the land, its climate, the culture of the people, according to ecological laws, the laws of the planet, natural laws, and that people have the freedom to practice an agriculture. But food sovereignty also includes the rights of the eaters. After all, we are food. We are made of food. We are what we eat. We are culturally distinctive because of the way our land has shaped the crops that have then shaped the cultures. A rice-eating culture doesn't treat wheat as food. Mm -hmm. A vegetarian culture doesn't treat meat as food. 
So food is by its very definition cultural, it's our identity. And the right to choose the food you grow and eat, the right to know what you're eating are fundamental elements of food sovereignty at the level of the individual and community but also at the level of nations. We buy cars from elsewhere. Some people control the manufacture of cars. We buy airplanes from elsewhere. We buy technology from elsewhere. Why is food so different? Well, food is different for three important reasons. Um, everyone can't make an aeroplane. It does need very specialized plants to manufacture an aeroplane, and therefore you have Airbus and you have Boeing, and that's it. It finishes with those two monopolies. Mm -hmm. um, but food is something that everyone has grown. Most of the people of the world are still farmers. Most of the women of the world are farmers. And to tell them, leave it to a Monsanto because an aeroplane can only be made by a Boeing, so the seeds will only be made by Monsanto, is a very false presentation. The second reason why it's not an issue of buying a Boeing plane is because the minute you have patented the seed, the minute you've turned it into the property of the five corporations, the farmers are paying for seed which was free. Most importantly, the country is losing precious foreign exchange. India is draining $200 million for paying royalties to Monsanto for the BT cotton. The Brazilian peasants sued Monsanto because Monsanto was extracting $2.2 billion as royalty payment. So if the British had created an economic drain that took our wealth out of our countries, this model will create an economic drain that will take our wealth out. But the political consequence is, my, in my view, the most significant. Henry Kissinger, during the Vietnam War, had said, food is the ultimate weapon. When we sell arms, we control armies. When we sell food, we control people. And I would say when this control seed, they control the very fabric of life. And it is that absolute dictatorship. You have the option to buy a Boeing or not buy a Boeing. But you don't have the option to not eat. A farmer doesn't have the option to not have seed. And therefore control over these vital aspects that make life possible and make food production possible is a political agenda of control over society. You mentioned that there were five companies involved. Which of these five companies and by what mechanism do they control the production of seeds? Well, the five companies that um, have emerged as the pushers of genetic engineering and patenting and seed laws um, are Monsanto, Syngenta, which is a merger of Sibagaygi, Santos, Astra and Zeneca, DuPont, Dow, BASF. Now, all of these five companies have their origins in war. They began co as companies to make chemicals to kill people, chemicals for chemical warfare. That is their expertise. When the wars got over, they manipulated science and they manipulated policy to say without these chemicals, food couldn't grow. Without the <laughs> chemical fertilizers that are produced in the explosive factories that were des designed for the war to make explosives. They said without chemical fertilizers we can't have soil fertility. Even though we have billions and trillions of soil organisms making the soil fertile if we give them food which is organic matter. Mm -hmm. They said without pesticides pests couldn't be controlled. Now they say without genetically modified BT cotton you can't control a pest. But the chemical agenda, which is also called the Green Revolution, was failing for two reasons. One, the chemicals themselves weren't working, soil fertility is declining, you're applying more and more fertilizer, you're spraying more and more pesticide, there are more pests. It was a failed technology. And so they came up with controlling the seed to sell more chemicals, as well as now create through genetic engineering an ownership of the seed. I am privileged that I was invited in 1987 to a conference in Geneva where the United Nations was there, these big companies were there. They hadn't yet become seed companies. They were planning to become seed companies. They were still agrochemical giants. And then there were independent scientists and some of us invited. The conference was called 
the laws of life, the emerging biotechnology, understanding its consequences. And the industry laid out very clearly, we won't make future profits from mm -hmm. chemicals alone. So we have to marry our chemicals to seeds and through genetic engineering, we have to claim ownership on the seed to collect royalties from where our future profits will come. The desperation is because they've calculated trillions and trillions of dollars of profits thinking that they can make every farmer dependent on their seed and every country dependent on genetic engineering. But I happened to be at that meeting. I dedicated my life then onwards to saving the seed, studying genetic engineering and its impact, influencing our own laws through democratic processes that ensured that Monsanto could not have the kind of monopolies it was seeking, that life could not be defined as an invention which they wanted. In Indian law, life is not an invention, biological processes are not invention and also built alternatives. So for 30 years I've built alternatives and I can say that seed in farmers' hands, sovereign decisions in the hands of countries, that's the future of food security. There are five companies that you have described and there are between seven and eight billion of us on the planet and several governments and uh, institutions, the United Nations, WTO and so on. How come that these five companies would attempt to control the world? What is the mechanism? How do they hope to control the world? Well, the first mechanism, as I mentioned, is writing the laws. That's why I call it corporate rules, that corporations write the laws. After all, the laws of intellectual property, Monsanto has admitted, they wrote in the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. Cargill and agribusiness companies like that, which don't control the seed but they control the trade, wrote the agriculture agreement. The vice president of Cargill was made the head of negotiations of the United States. The second is they do use the power of the United States to push this agenda. They happen to be U.S. multinationals. Monsanto is a U.S. multinational, Cargill is a U.S. multinational, Walmart is a U.S. multinational. And between the three of them, they could totally, absolutely control what we eat. But where did they get the gumption of seeking to control the world? They got the gumption through two myths. The first is the myth they floated of free trade. Now we know this is not free trade because when India was colonized by the East India Company, the treaty they wrote through bribing the Mughal court was called the free trade treaty between the right honorable East India Company and the Mughal Empire. They call what is freedom for corporations, freedom for the world, which is the opposite. Every time Monsanto has freedom to control seed, a farmer loses freedom to have seed. Every time uh, imposition of these laws is put on countries, that country loses food sovereignty and food de democracy. The new language for these free trade treaties is partnership, so beautiful a word. Hmm. The economic partnership for Africa. You the, to come there. You're, you're coming the transatlantic part. That's it. Mm -hmm. The second is they have built up a myth of technology and technological process, progress. Uh, and they push whatever they want to sell as the cutting edge of technology, even though when you look at it at an ecological level, or you look at it at a level of social justice, or you look at it at the level of democracy and sovereignty, these are very, very primitive technologies. So they say chemicals got you the green revolution, and now we are going to bring you the second green revolution, which is genetic engineering. And tucked into this is all kind of manufactured lies that genetic engineering produces more food. It doesn't. Nowhere have yields increased because of genetic engineering. That genetic engineering reduces pests and allows you to get rid of chemicals. Everywhere chemical use has increased with genetically engineered seeds. That farmers do better and become more prosperous. Everywhere farmers are poorer because what was their resource, their sovereign, common heritage, has now become an intellectual property they must buy. In India, the seed cost jumped 8,000%, which is what led 
to farmers getting into debt and the 284,000 farmer suicides. Now, because of the fact that they're collecting money out of doing no work, the farmers working in the field, the countries had their own breeding programs and all they do is with these new intellectual property laws steal the genetic wealth of the world. But they also, with their money then, control the media. There's a lot of hunger in the world. Yes. There are many people who go to bed without food. And there's a lot of poverty in the world. At least there's the pretension that this new technology aims at dealing with the questions of poverty and hunger. How do we deal with the yes. world's poverty and hunger? So the corporate spring that genetic engineering is the answer to hunger and poverty is so totally wrong. First, if you look at the data, where does our food come from? 70% food today, 2014, comes from small farms. Industry produces commodities. Commodities are not designed to be eaten. They are designed to be traded. 70% of the food produced by small farms, 30% by industrial agriculture controlled by the seed corporations and agribusiness. The four crops that they have genetically modified and pushed, and there are millions of acreage in Argentina, in Brazil, in the United States, in Canada, um, not millions in Africa, and I hope it will never be millions in Africa, in cotton, in India. 10% of the corn and soya that is genetically modified is eaten by people. 90% goes for biofuel and animal feed. So it's not a food system and it's in fact at the heart of hunger because if you're taking land and water and producing commodities that don't feed people, you are designing hunger. But you are also designing poverty because a farmer who's buying chemicals and a farmer who's buying patented and genetically modified seed must by necessity be spending more money, getting into debt, he's trapped in a negative economy, which means the farmer gets poorer, the countries get poorer. This is not an answer to hunger and poverty. The answer to hunger and poverty is more biodiversity. Our work in India over 30 years has shown that the more you intensify biodiversity, which means different species together, and you allow them to work through ecological processes, you control the pests, you increase the soil fertility, you increase the productivity, we can double and triple acreage productivity and definitely increase the nutrition food. But for our farmers, they get 10 times higher incomes than when they are trapped in the chemical intensive and GMO cycle that the corporations want to impose. Agroecology is the emerging science. The reductionist mechanistic science of genetic engineering is a primitive science that my discipline of quantum theory that I was trained in for my masters and my PhD in the foundations of quantum mechanics as an interdisciplinary thesis. We gave that up a hundred years ago because we know the world is interconnected. Mm -hmm. To assume that you live in a mechanistic universe and to keep pushing a outmoded science as the latest science is so wrong. The latest science is agroecology, a science of interrelationships in an ecological system. And the experts of agroecology are the peasants of the third world. After all, they've done this for 10,000 years, not yesterday. Not like Monsanto, which has never worked in a field, which has never done agriculture, was only a chemical warfare company. 10, 20 years ago, they t tried to take over the seed, but it is the expertise of killing and the expertise of piracy. This is not the expertise of growing food. Our systems can improve when the ancient tested knowledge of the farmers, the peasants and our grandmothers joins with the cutting edge of science, of agroecology, epigenetics, of all the ecological sciences that are showing us that the real foundation of agricultural production is enhancing the natural capital. The United Nations Environment Program has done a report avoiding future famines and they've calculated how much we are losing in terms of food production because we've allowed the soils to degrade, we've allowed our water to disappear, we've allowed the pollinators to be killed by the pesticides and Bt cotton. These are the processes through which we get food but most important is the intelligence, love, care, 
experience heritage and freedom of the farmer who is the one who really produces food. Welcome back to Hot Issues and we are in conversation with Dr. Vandana Shiva, an activist, somebody who has worked on GMO foods, who's worked on the patenting of seeds and crops and so on, and uh, she's in Ghana to give solidarity to food sovereignty Ghana. Just before we went on the break, I raised the issue of rewards for scientific work. Those engaged in genetically modified food, genetically modifying foods and so on, say that the patenting is important so that they can reap benefits from their labor. Okay. The first issue related to seed is the labor, is the labor of the seed. Mm -hmm. After all, the seed multiplies and reproduces itself on its own. Monsanto doesn't do it and that's why one of Monsanto's claims has been rejected by the Indian Patent Office on the uh, basis of Article 3J of our patent law which says biological processes are not an invention. They make themselves. Life makes itself. It reproduces. The second is the primary breeders are farmers. They've done the breeding. Any material Monsanto touches. It can grab the soya beans of the world but those soya seeds have been bred by thousands of years of innovation in our high Himalayan mountains in China, in Japan. When they take the corn, they didn't invent the corn. Farmers and peasants of the ancient corn civilization of Mexico took Teosinti, a wild plant, and turned it into the domesticated varieties that we have. So if you're talking of rewarding labor, the first labor sh that should be rewarded is that of the farmer, which is why I repeatedly say the only breeders' rights bills that have any status in society should be farmers' rights bills. Second is scientists do take what farmers have bred and cross them in conventional breeding. And in the case of the genetic engineering company, shoot a toxic gene. Where the breeding is done by public institutions, they're working for the public good. They're getting salaries from our taxes. So seed as a commons is what farmers have practiced. They've never said the seed is mine, I selected the best crop and now you pay me a royalty from the neighboring farmer. They never do that. For them seed sharing and seed shaving is the ethos. Public breeders have worked for the good of society. There is something called the good of society and the larger common good. And if public research scientists are paid a salary, they're already getting the reward from society for their labor. When it comes to the genetically engineered seed and the reward to Monsanto, I get very amused with this. The idea that a Monsanto has intellectual property rights. First of all, Monsanto is not a person. They pretend to be a person. They would like to be treated as a person, but they're a fiction. They're a corporate ar arrangements. It's a legal arrangement. They're legal entity, not a natural person. A natural person can have a mind. A piece of paper doesn't have a mind. Mm -hmm. And then to say they need intellectual property because they've created a new life form. If you really look at what have they done, genetic engineering so far is only two applications. Bt toxin plants which produce a pesticide into the plant by introducing a bacterial gene into it. Herbicide tolerant plants which put in again bacterial genes so that the company can sell more of its herbicides. Mm -hmm. Both of these are toxic genes in our food system. There's an environmental law called the polluter must pay. Mm -hmm. We've twisted it on its head through this cooked up category of intellectual property rights on seed which Monsanto has cooked up and say the polluter will get paid. They will contaminate our food with toxics. They will pollute our varieties with genetic pollution. And they will be rewarded? No. The law is they should be punished for putting toxics into our food. Any honest sovereign government should today should be punishing them for contaminating our food chain. So who should be profiting from food production? Should anybody be profiting from food production at all? Wait, I think there are two very important issues about issue of profiting. I, I believe in the law of return. That's my guiding economics, it's my guiding ecology, it's my guiding productivity. That we work with the soil, we should return fertility to the soil. 
when we eat food we must return adequate wealth through the farmer so that they can live with dignity with freedom and have all their welfare guarantee of course we need returns but the idea of a fake person creating a fake property right to grab the seeds of the world to then make 50% profits of every seed that a farmer grows is a unethical illegitimate profit because it's a one way extraction mm -hmm. from third world countries which gave the biodiversity from the farmers who evolved the biodiversity we have gifted all this none of the material that they are patenting originated i have four three big cases one was the patenting of neem and i'm so happy to see all over accra the neem tree mm -hmm. they patented it for a pest pesticide us government and wr grace i fought the case 11 years to establish that we had the prior art this was not an invention the basmati from dune valley the aromatic rice that people love all over a company in texas rice tech claimed to have invented it monsanto claimed to have invented an old wheat variety from india that does not contribute to gluten allergies now this claim to invention and therefore the claim to a reward through a monopoly is illegitimate at every level someone like me who could have had a comfortable position in a university probably been a president of a university by now if i am doing the work i do giving up a secure career track if i am traveling to africa it is so we can all join hands to build on the alternatives that are ours to shape to build the sovereignties that we need in this new time of a new kind of slavery which begins with the slavery through the seed well in Ghana we, we are discussing a plant breeders bill and some of our scientists say look it's not about the rewards to Monsanto it's not about the maximization of profit of, of giant corporations and so on we are scientists we are modifying seeds and rather than allow Monsanto and others to benefit, we want to benefit. Is that a sound argument? No, it's a totally unsound argument for two reasons. First, every one of these scientists who suddenly is saying I must be rewarded was a public servant till yesterday. A public servant means you serve society. Where does this thing of I own the seed, even if you are in the CSIR or wherever, where does it come from? You are a public servant, work for the public good. Or leave a public research leave it and try and struggle like the farmer struggle to see how far you can go without that luxury salary but the second reason it's so false is that these five companies that control the seed supply did not do the breeding others have done the breeding monsanto has locked into licensing uh, licensing arrangement 60 indian seed companies it has such a huge octopus reach that even if a Ghanaian scientist does do work, and I'm sure each there is no scientist I know anywhere in the world who does genetic engineering without sponsorship by either a USAID project, a Gates financing, or a corporate financing. And that is very, very important to watch. They might today claim it's them versus Monsanto. But the reality is... I do not know of a single scientist who can work a breeder's rights or a patent commercially. Because at the end of the day, it's what do you do with it commercially. If they're scientists, are they sellers of seed? If they're not sellers of seed, that intellectual property as a breeder's right is an empty right. It's only solid in the hands of a Monsanto. So any scientist of Ghana who pretends that they need intellectual property rights are lying. Because an intellectual property rights in the hands of a public scientist is an unworkable right unless it becomes a partnership with a global company that will commodify that seed. You've done some work in India, and there have been several reported cases of suicide and so on. How is India dealing with this problem of genetically modified foods and of plant breeders' control over seeds and so on? So let me begin with the plant breeders control. In 1994, some of our scientists who were influenced by the industry were saying exactly the same thing 
as some of the Ghanaian scientists are saying, that we need to do this to implement the trade-related intellectual property rights agreement of the World Trade Organization. That too is a lie. The agreement says very clearly that part, per, parties may exclude from patentability plants and animals, so you can avoid patents on life, uh, but they must have a sui generis system. A sui generis means self-evolving. Mm. Ghana should write a sui generis law. The law of WTO does not say implement UPOV. We fought very hard to ensure that it did not. My ambassador, Mr. S. P. Shukla, was responsible for ensuring that there was no breeders' rights put into that treaty. So it's not true that it's an obligation of international law. Mm -hmm. We, my, my government then appointed me on the expert group to write that law. And we have a farmer's rights clause. The breeders' rights bill should be a farmer's rights bill. That the farmer's right to s first to recognize that farmers are the first breeders. Second, to recognize that their potential to continue breeding in partnership with scientists is the basis of Ghana's food security. The right to evolve, save, exchange, sell, seed for the farmer should never be alienated. As far as genetic engineering is concerned, Monsanto entered illegally into India in 1998 with BT Cotton. I had to sue them and eventually it took them four or five years before they could get the approvals. Uh, they started to lock in our farmers into deep debt and it's the debt that has caused the suicide. Now if you look at the cotton areas, which is where the debt is highest, where 95 percent of the cotton is now Monsanto's BT cotton, this is how the graph of suicides is rising. The industry will show you flat graphs of average suicides across the country, including in the known cotton areas. 70 percent of the suicides are in the cotton belt. 52 was the suicides in 2001. 2006 it had jumped to 1,448. Every half hour, a farmer in these regions of Maharashtra in Vidarbha is committing suicide. Has it increased yields? No. In the last five years, the yields of cotton have come down from 588 to about 480. Mm -hmm. Pests are not being controlled. Farmers are using 13 times more pesticide spray. When Ghana is told adopt BT cotton, the reality of what's happened to the BT cotton farmers in Mahara should be part of it. I would invite some of your parliamentarians to make a trip. Our parliament wrote a very detailed report after four years of investigation and they said GMOs have no place in India's future. What then has a place? What has a in place? In India? In India, as much as in Ghana, is first the fact that our seeds are not primitive seeds. They've been defined as primitive. You're wearing beautiful clothing. But if the British have their way, you shouldn't be wearing it. You should be wearing shirts and pants and a suit and a tie. You look so dignified and beautiful. Yeah, I feel uh, proud wearing my sari. And maybe now, a wig. <laughs> but <laughs> just as they try to make it look like there's a primitive primitiveness in our languages and in our clothing. They're now declaring our seeds are primitive. Our seeds are fertile. They're adaptive. They evolve. On our farm where we save seeds, and I started the movement of Dania, we save 3,000 varieties of rices. Every year the seeds are increasing their yield by 10% because we are giving them fertility, we are giving them love, we are giving them care. So seed is not stagnant and static. The potential of evolution is in our native varieties that have been tested through centuries to be adapted to our soil. They are also the more appropriate ones for our food cultures. The system of production based on biodiversity needs to be an ecological system which is called agroecology in today's new language, organic farming. And I'm so happy to share with you that just yesterday our parliament of the new government opened and this is the speech our Prime Minister gave. I think what we need is a time-bound plan to change over to organic agriculture which has been proved by scientific studies to be able to produce enough food to feed mankind and enable the upliftment of villages. And he later in the speech said, and it also leads to the conservation of our natural resources. The evidence is so clear from the United Nations, from movements like ours which work with 750,000 farmers, from leaders like the new Prime Minister of India, 
that chemical farming, farming with poisons, farming with GMOs is crude and primitive and obsolete and it only works for the five giants. We now need to move into systems that work for the 300 million species, the 7 billion people and all future generations. Water sources are drying up and you need water for agriculture. What is the situation with water sources, GMOs and all of this patenting and so on? Is there a connection between the drying up of water sources and this technology? There's a very deep connection between the expansion of GMO monocultures and the water scarcity. Both my practices with agroecological farming as well as my studies on agriculture have shown that a monoculture industrial system uses 10 times more water to produce the same amount of food. The Bt cotton requires irrigation and one reason it's failing is most of our farmers don't have irrigation and therefore the crop fails. 10 times more water diverted to a non-food producing agriculture is at the root of the water crisis globally. You just have to look at what happened to our beautiful fertile state of Punjab, the land of the five rivers. That's what it means, Punjab. Mm -hmm. Today, it has such a severe water scarcity that people kill each other over water. States are fighting over water. Water wars have been triggered by a thirsty agriculture. Ecological agriculture does the opposite. It uses less water. It grows varieties that have been evolved to be water prudent, but most importantly, what it gives back is clean water, whereas what the industrial system gives is polluted water. The water from herbicide tolerant GMO farms has now such heavy loads of glyphosate, and the diseases related to glyphosate are just exploding from kidney failure to new cancers on a scale that we've never seen before. How do you deal with those diseases? Well, you have to get rid of the poisons that cause those diseases. Cancers are triggered by putting poisons into our bodies. Poisons should never have been part of our food. GMOs are toxic inside the plant and doubly toxic because they use chemicals like glyphosate and Roundup. We can do better farming. The way to create healthy food and a disease-free society is to do an agriculture that doesn't depend on these chemicals and these multinationals. And as I said, an agriculture that produces more at lower cost, brings fire ha farmers high income so there's less poverty, brings people more nutrition so there's less hunger and malnutrition. Most importantly, at the end of the day, it conserves our resources and produces health. The bill for ecological destruction and the bill for health hazards induced by GMOs and a chemical agriculture is so huge. We have started to do the true cost of industrial farming and when these bills get added up no one will be able to afford this agriculture that only works for the profits of a few. We will then realize that it is too costly for the earth to bear it is too costly for farmers to bear. It's too costly for our bodies to bear. Hello and welcome back to Hot Issues. And we are in conversation with Dr. Vardana Shiva. I raised the question about the free trade agreements, economic partnership agreement and so on. What is the connection with GMOs, with patents and so on? What is the connection? Well, in the case of the World Trade Organization, which is the global free trade agreement in contemporary times. The introduction of patenting was done through that treaty. And of course, Monsanto wrote that treaty. Even the introduction of GMOs has been pushed through that treaty. In 2003, because Europe was GMO free, Monsanto complained to President Bush that Europe is not accepting our seeds and our foods. The European Union was sued by the US government in the WTO to require a removing of the bans and the moratoria. I started a global citizens campaign. 300 million signatures were taken to the World Trade Organization. 
to say this is wow. not between US and Europe. It is between Monsanto and the people of the world. And we are watching what kind of decision you make. Because if you decide in favor of Monsanto, it means you're taking away our freedom. And we will announce you to be a Monsanto-driven trade organization, not a world trade organization. They backed off. They did not rule against Europe in any serious way. Because most of the world is still GMO-free and because most of the seeds are patent-free, Monsanto is now trying two new things. One is the new partnership agreements is a new way because the language is so beautiful it's perfect as Orwellian double speak uh, partnership who could have anything against it and they are basically putting into these new treaties which are called the partnership agreements three important clauses that go beyond World Trade Organization one is to make it impossible for any country to be GMO free strong GMO push clauses second very strong clauses on patenting and monopolies so that no country can do what, for example, India has done with our farmers' rights and our exclusion clauses. But the third is the most serious, and this is where the world should rise. And these are called investor state suits. It looks very harmless. It looks like an investor should get justice if something happened. But the reality is an investor is another name for a corporation. And investor state suits are if a country responds to its public that demands that health stay as a public good mm -hmm. or education stay as a public good or seeds stay in farmers' hands. These companies through these new partnership agreements are claiming the right as persons to sue countries for compensation. Say, I would have made a trillion dollars if... Ghana had pat allowed me to have breeders' rights and patents. Mm -hmm. You haven't allowed me, so pay me a trillion anyway. I would have ha made so much money if I had privatized the water supply of Accra, and you haven't allowed it, pay me this much money anyway. Now, this has already started in the real world. Chevron is suing the government of Ecuador after having polluted the Amazon and after having lost a case to the indigenous people of Ecuador. They're now telling the government, you pay for all the compensation, $40 billion. A company in California sued Canada, which said, but we, said, we don't want to trade in water mm -hmm. under NAFTA. Company said, no, we would have made so much profit, $8 billion. You're preventing us from making the profit, so we sue you, you pay us any way. Bechtel sued Bolivia when Be Bechtel was thrown out by the water movement, movement against water privatization, which led to Eva Morales coming up. So what you have is a very perverse situation of corporations claiming personhood and claiming rights above citizens and above governments. Corporations and businesses are supposed to be governed by democratic law. They're not above any country. They're not above any citizen. And as I said, they have a derived legal entity. They're not human persons. So we are actually in the middle of a cosmic battle of who is a person. Is it people like you and me or is it invisible corporations? Now, the genetic modification is certainly not just going on in crops. It's going on in animals as well. And some animals in some places are food. What's the attitude to genetic modification in animals as well? Well, I can tell you so many of the genetic engineering of animals has absolutely failed. You might remember Dolly the sheep. Mm -hmm. They called her an invention and they called Ian Wilmot an inventor. The company that had done the work had said sheep are just furry little factories that will manufacture human proteins in their milk because they put a human gene into Dolly's mother. 272 of Dolly's sisters were born crippled, one eye, two ears, five hoofs. Today Dolly is in a museum, failed. There was a Herman the Bull in which they put another human genome and said, oh, Herman will sire 200 cows and they 
will now provide human milk. Human milk in a cow because there's a genetically engineered protein put in from humans. Failure. There's a pig that's got a human growth hormone. Can't even stand because it's gone beyond its proportions and its feet won't carry it. They're trying to do a genetically engineered salmon whose appetite is so huge that it'll destroy all the fish. And if it escapes into the wild, it'll contaminate wild stocks of salmon totally and wipe it all out. The huge protests, most places are not accepting genetically engineered animals. But we too are animals. And anything that can be done to humans can be done to animals. I want to mention that we have stopped through global movements a technology called the Terminator technology, originally for plants, designed to make sterile plants, but the tool itself and the patent claim does not say it's just for plants. It is a tool of genetic engineering for creating sterile sterility in plants, in animals, in humans. We are up against not just a greed empire that is powerful. We are up against the most perverse thinking that thinks no, that is beyond control at this point. That's why the challenge of freedom and sovereignty in our times is how to regulate these corporations that have become too big for the good of the planet or people. What would the collapse, instead of the celebration of life, look like? In fact, a we future are... A future 100 years from now, a future 200 years from now, which is witnessing the collapse of life. I don't think we have 200 years. I don't think we have even 100 years on that path of destruction, which has taken away 75% of the planetary potential to provide us food. 75% of ecological destruction comes from that model. 75% of the diseases we face come from that model. It's just a few years more of doing business as usual that will lead to collapse. But we are seeing the symptoms of collapse. After all, let's not forget that the Egypt Arab Spring began with bread. Because a system based on profits is not just turning seed into a profitable source of a patented commodity. It is turning food into a source of profits to be traded and speculated on. And that is leading for our parts of the world a price rise that is leading to stability, instability. We saw that in Egypt. The new government formed in India is totally because of the anger around the rise of prices of food. Syria was peasants uprising because of failure of these chemical crops in the face of drought. So often what we are told are ethnic conflicts, religious conflicts. Darfur are at the end of it. Conflicts generated by an agriculture model that is destroying the fabric of life, the sustainability of resources, and the interconnectedness and cohesion of society with diversity. So conflicts ha are having a lot to do with the... Co the collapse will have three faces. And all of the s trends are seen. It will have collapse of ecosystems. If there's no water in a valley, you can't farm you'll be displaced. It'll have the face of health collapse where more and more nutrition is denied to people, more and more autism. Let me give you just two figures. In India, half our children are suffering from so much malnourishment because of a system that is designed for profit, not for food. Half of them. In US, they're predicting that half of the children will be autistic because of the combination of chemicals and GMOs. You're writing off half of the future. So health will be the second collapse. And the third will be civic disintegration and political disintegration, where we turn into strife, where gangs come up, where militias come up. And before you know it, people kill each other. It, we don't know which of the three will be faster for which society. But this we do know, that going on this path that takes away the resources of people, destroys their potential to meet their needs, to create economies, and to defend their freedoms, is a recipe for collapse. Madam, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Well, viewers, we've been listening to Dr. Vandana Shiva, an activist on GMO foods. She's been campaigning against... Uh, 
you know, plant breeders bills that steal the rights of farmers and so on. And she's been in Ghana and she's spoken to us. I do hope that she's brought some clarity to the issues that we have discussed. But as I always say, please don't move your dial from TV3.